Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. We have a Patreon that our biggest supporters are watching us stream this video live in full effect. And uh, this is going to be a uh, Kayfabe Effect book. I have a feeling, man. They're going to get first dibs because they're getting all our videos before anybody else does. Uh, but these videos are brought to you by the books that we make. And uh, right now I have Red Room Kip Crypto Killers Issue 1 being solicited in comic shops. Tell your story you want a copy. Uh, two trade paperbacks are out there, Red Room, The Anti-Social Network, and Red Room, Trigger Warnings. It's the 10th anniversary of Hip Hop Family Tree. There are three volumes of X-Men Grand Design, and you'll find the occasional WYSIWYG out there if you look long and hard enough. Jimmy's going to have Hulk Grand Design forthcoming at the end of February. Plain Janes is out there. Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive and uh, Street Angel Princess of Poverty. Princess of Poverty. Is going to be uh, forthcoming. Put in your pre-orders for that. We're done paying the bills. Uh, less, listen... Not only are we the presidents of Cartoonist Kayfabe, but we are also the members. Uh, we are the first members. We are the first to be Kayfabe affected. And we had that amazing conversation with Brian Boland uh, sometime back, uh, where we were going through the killing joke page by page with Uncle Brian. And the edition that he was using, uh, he was actually using some Italian edition that he liked, but he held up the uh, killing joke uh, absolute edition that uh, includes his color, it includes John Higgins' color, it has the script, uh, all that stuff. I was not faking it when uh, <laughs> we were making that video, and I said, oh, I'm buying that. Uh, got off the recording, and I bought it. Here it is in its slipcase. Got it for like $20, because there's a little ding on the, on the mm, slipper. But that, that doesn't uh, make me cry in any way, shape, or form. Uh, you got your front image, the classic image recolored by uh, Uncle Brian. And Let's see a comparison of that real quick. Yes, uh, you've got two uh, two you color can... versions. Not 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 outrageously different. This is like a guide mm -hmm. because uh, you can see the practical hand putting the little white on top of his airbrushed color there. And here he's just using, you know, Wacom tablet or something. Much different green right there. But, you know, using an airbrush tool inside the... Uh, computer. I think it's worth noting because we are, we do look at so many books and sometimes not in flattering light. This is the second absolute that we're looking at. It so, is. you know, hats off to DC and putting these absolutes together. The other one was Batman Year One that uh, we both have broken down and bought. A uh, testament to at least some of their absolute editions and what they're putting in them. Um, some really a plus material in yeah. these things. And we'll go and we'll go through this a little bit. In the conversation with Brian Bolland, he said when he did these like side views, right? He wanted to create some 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 new material for the box set. He had to set up guides, right? To mm -hmm. to sort of get all of the the imagery accurately. Like the guy is nothing if not thorough. Yeah. So what he meant by that is just like he had to create like a template to make sure that the eye hits there, that the nose hits here, that the bump hits a certain spot you can really go crazy with setting up your guides i've done it a lot of times because i did animation stuff right. where i had to do the turnarounds you know maybe you choose like this eyebrow like where that hits the teeth maybe the bottom lip if you do enough grids you know you do them piecemeal don't put all the grids because you'll just have a million lines but you know ha handle all the important bits at first look at how like photo ref that like that looks that's totally it, it just almost looks like a collage piece yeah, yeah, really super tight. Yeah. Feels a little bit more mechanical, you know? Like, it we've really talked does. about Look his digital, ear. and some of the lines have that, they kind of have that digital quality. I'm, it, I'm a little bit surprised to see. Yeah, it does. When you see it close, like, this ear looks very kind of digital. It almost looks unfinished, to be honest. Like, whoosh, where's that little piece right there? But, uh, nonetheless, cool package. And, uh, it has... I love the end paper show off the uh the the rain because again this is something we talked about man first first topic of, of heart <laughs> talk in our interview with him because like drawing all your blacks and leaving the whites open i've done that a lot because i don't have a white media i like but it's inconceivable yeah. almost to me to do it at this level like this he's drawing mm -hmm. that wild i uh, i don't make it a point to like stare at our faces the whole time while we're you know editing and talking to these guys but uh the kayfabers certainly see us and they made note of our reaction whenever we talked like th that part of the conversation plus when uncle brian shows off a piece of art and when 
it's almost like we're like Lady and the Tramp. Our heads are uncomfortably too close to one another <laughs> as we get so close to that monitor <laughs> to pour over the artwork that uh, he he was showing us. One of the nice things right off the bat is this art's a little bit bigger. This it is. is a bigger book than the original printing. So, you know, for an artist like Bullen, it's so detailed. Make it bigger, you know, like like it's it's just it's very rewarding to uh It's a boutique package. It's a boutique package, no doubt. Uh so you got your bull in color. You got every we've all seen this mm -hmm. piece, but you got some closer reference. Look at that hand to that hand, right? We've got some closer reference to uh the the final cover. And by the way, I have to look like twice to make sure that's a sketch. It's right. so detailed. Right. There's your final piece right there. A little retrospective piece being written. Uh, a bit about the blue line color process that John Higgins embarked on. Oh man, I'm super glad to have this in here because we reference this a lot. We talk blue line process. There's also like a gray line process that's similar, but instead of blue, it's a very, very light gray. And the idea is you go directly into this and you add your color. And the black is its own separate layer that will then be put on top and photographed together to give you the final page. So when we talk blue line method, that's literally what we're describing. Yeah, you'll have like a piece of uh, acetate that will have just the black area. You see that little bullseye right there. You see that little bullseye right there. It used to be like a scotch tape that would have these little bullseyes. They're called registration dots or registration marks. So on your acetate black layer, you'll put two sets of those. On your color layer, you will put two sets as well. And you match those little crosshairs up with the black layer, with the color layer, and then that gives you uh, an on-register approach, man. The color is directly behind the black line. Uh, when you see the color shift or whatever, you could rest assured that the dots are not lining up when it hits the printing process, and it's not gonna happen. Uh, the publishers will tell you that a quarter inch off is a good print job. Often you'll see the original art being sold for this kind of thing, yeah. where like your acetate cover is taped on, you know, and you can lift it up and see the color and then put it down and see it with the uh, line art yes. on top. Uh, so they give us both colored editions. We just looked at the Brian Bulland. Here is the John Higgins, but they they throw John under the fucking bus by publishing this stuff on a toothy. This is amazing to paper. me. Why would they do Look this? Look at because how shit that is. It's not even. I thought that that both editions might have been on this uncoated stock. No, and it isn't. It's just this one. Yeah, they're throwing John Higgins completely under the bus. What a weird choice. Because with the blue line color approach, there's a reason why you go mechanical. Oh, yeah, yeah, pull up page one. Page one will be plenty good. This is um, why I make such a big deal out of it is the original. A lot of times, like Batman Year One edition that we have, yeah. they do this, and it's brilliant because it was printed on newsprint originally, originally. and those colors look great. You know, they show Built the original colors. The, exactly. The newsprint color. But this was done on a coated stock, a glossy kind of paper, so there was no version like this. No, never. This is, this is uh, the Hollywood version. This is nonsense, and it's blotchy. It's darker. You you know you talk you talk about dot gain. There's dot gain to this, and you can't do the blue line process on this kind of paper because the values you're getting are muddy and kind of fucked up. You can look even right here. Look, it's off reg. It's your off register mm -hmm. compared to this. This is on register. So this is this was a big misstep, and it really strange makes uh it makes John John Higgins work not. Not flattering at all. It's a bizarre choice. Uh, it's yeah. It's it's a it, it's a shame. It's a shame. Like the blotch of it is embarrassing. Um, you got to leave it to the public. They're gonna fuck something up. They're gonna fuck something up because there's a lot of uh, benefits to this, and I, I still say you got to get it. Yeah, it's it's still very beautiful, and I I don't even hate seeing it that way. It's just an odd choice because like that's not even the default paper. No, so exactly. You went out of your way to put a paper in that wasn't the right. There's paper. Huey, Dewey, and Louie with the progeria eyes. Oh man, so those things look unsettling every time you see them. Yes, now my friends, this is uh, this is why you buy this book, and here's what you do: you you do not throw away 
the original. This is not an upgrade. This is in addition to. We all have Killing Joke. Uh, so you keep that. Complete Alan Moore script is included in here. Uh, Brian says that like he, he knew the guy who owned the script. Must have bought it. You know, we got the signature from both of the guys. Um, interesting conversations to have there. Like, you know, would Alan Moore have written the script if he thought anybody but Brian was going to see it? Brian or the editor? You know, like there could be some private stuff in here. Like whatever. Um, but it's for a work for hire work. So morally... It might be a bad thing, but like business wise, they're able to do it, whatever. DC owns it, I DC guess. DC owns it. Um, I do think that, that there, there's probably some gray legality there. Yeah, yeah, because they, what did they buy? Did they buy this, this or. Right, you know, because they don't own the original art. And I don't know how the, the handwritten script or, you know, hand typed, one of a kind thing, I, I don't know that they would own it. They might own the intellectual right. concept of it, but the physical object, I don't know about. So. Everything that you see with this kind of checkerboard, that's the script. It's it's beyond, like, you add up both uh, Killing Joke editions, and there's more script <laughs> than both of those Killing Joke editions. Uh, if you see here, like, there's a whole page of just atmosphere. Yeah, preamble. Being uh, described here. Now, uh, just last night I started, and now this is why you don't upgrade. It's in addition to your Killing Joke, because you read the panel one here and then you have your own copy to look at exactly like while you're reading the thing it's easier to do it this way than to like go back yeah right you know so you have the text right here um i would say that brian bolo is very magnanimous in certain ways because he actually brings a lot to the table you know like i've, I've only gotten psh, seven eight pages worth of comic in which is to say <clears throat> 20 pages of uh this typewritten script uh, I'm shocked to see the typewriting is all uppercase. It it's not harder to read. It's not it, it uh, for for this kind of stuff. For everything that's not like the dialogue balloons and stuff, it is. So like for the descriptive, see that seems backwards. Yeah, you know, like make the dialogue and captions all uppercase since that's how it's typically lettered. There's a reason for that, and you'll see it in uh, these bits. So this is just there's no standard way to format comic right. scripts. You do it as you do it. Uh, so he chooses to use these bolds to explain the stuff. And then at the end of each piece, it'll say no dialogue in like typical, you know, yeah. uh, uppercase, lowercase. Um, reading the scripts and then like looking at the corresponding pages. First off, dude, let's get that artist edition, right? Like let's track down. It's only 48 pages. Let's track these down. Oh, yeah. Um, What's the underline denote? Do you know? It is, like, the stuff that is, at least in these pieces, right, like, these initial sessions, it's the stuff that you definitely see. Like, a lot of this is color, yeah. commentary, and emotion, but, like, you're getting a little road surface, you know, the headlights of a car. Like, this is the exact stuff that definitely is going in here. Everything else is, like, inspiring you as creator uh, to, you know, give us give us what you got. Um totally entrancing it's extremely good uh we are missing a big part of comics culture not having access to every alan moore script uh the complete watchman script all that stuff we need it all it, it, for the good of comics uh it, it needs to be out there um, yeah and the ones that are out there are prohibitively expensive like the uh from hell scripts you know like they published some of those good luck buying one of those now is that true uh so there's some good stuff in here that you really like. And, and okay, so I get the sense, uh, there are parts in this early part of the script, I get the sense that Alan Moore is maybe longhand writing something and just enough to do thumbnails. And then he does his own thumbnails, as everybody says he does, and then looks at those thumbnails and then goes into the final script, like imagining what a Brian Ballin might do in that scene, like really trying to visualize and write beyond what his own artistic capabilities are. And there's indicators in here. Uh, there's parts like we're still on page one where he's saying stuff like, uh, I've worked it out to um, where we're going to reveal Batman's face on page four. So do not show it. Like, like we're building to something here. Uh, so use every trick in a book to like, not give us a satisfying shot of Batman yet. 
um, this this bit here, the page before this and this bit, it's very uh, telling. And I can't wait to read further because I am comparing every panel as I'm reading, so it's going to take a little while. Uh, this in the script is intended... Okay, page three. This is a full page splash picture. These panels are supposed to be on a previous page. And Brian Boland decided to decompress some of the other panels. It, it's specifically so Harvey Dent stuff. Mm-hmm. We're walking past Harvey Dent. So a lot of that was supposed to happen in like one panel. And Boland broke it up a little bit and decided to push some of the previous panels from page two to page three to give us this moment here. Um, the This is such a striking sequence to me. Yeah. Because I have, this is all new. What you're telling me right now, Ed, yeah. first time I've heard this about right. this specific sequence. But in my head, this is such a dramatic piece of the killing joke. Sure. You know, it's that entrance moment. Yeah. It blows my mind that it was not written this way exactly. Yeah. And there's some acting things. Um, the bits like... Uh, I never noticed her shuffling the cigarettes and, mm-hmm. like, dropping them on the table. That is de- described. This, like, you don't have to be crazy to work here, but it helps. That is described. There's a book on the desk... That's the comedians by so and so is described. It's not here. Brian Bullock and I get that to work. This piece of acting I have always noticed. I it, it's a good Commissioner Gordon moment. That is not in the script from Alan Moore. Brian Boland added this piece. So this is the bits that gets decompressed and and sort of like like is supposed to happen here, and then this is supposed to happen up here somewhere. And that last bit is supposed to happen there. Even just the action of the door opening as you turn the page mm-hmm. and enter the room. That, that makes a lot of sense. It's such a great page turn. Yeah. Yeah. In the script, it, it, like, it calls these keys out. The keys are important. Uh, Boy, they, they, they pop. They do. That, it, visually, he really captured the importance of those keys. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a, one of the fun pieces about reading the script and... And, and uh, all of that. There's the buttocks that, that we were talking about. Sure. Now, Jimmy, we're going to get to a piece that I know you're going to you're going to pop for, because now we're getting into the dialoguing, mm-hmm. right? And I know that you're very particular about your like line cuts. Yeah, that's what this is. This is Alan Moore deciding, like, imagining like where the um where the bubbles should cut off, like each line should cut off. Yeah. So that it has like the flow that he's looking for. Yeah, and, and some of the stuff that you'll see here that I do. So to talk, right? Don't break up that that verb. Right. Uh, you know, like a verb phrase, ideally a prepositional phrase. Like keep these things together. Yeah. As it, much as possible. You know, like you'll like, see it on like proper names. You yeah. never break up a proper name across lines. At least you shouldn't. Right. Um, but it's there's a lot of this stuff where in my mind it's just easier to read if you keep these certain groupings together yeah. as much as possible. There are places where space, you just can't do it. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, you got a lot of control there. So, so here's why he uses all caps, man, because when he's using proper dialogue, he's calling out what he wants in bold. Yeah. And I suppose you could have done uh, underline. an underline or something, but he doesn't. Um, so that's, that's sort of why he does. Yeah. I like that. That beyond the dialogue. And it's not like I, I, I passed it up. There's the FNAP of the cards mm-hmm. He is telling the letterer, this is a small sound effect. He's indicating everything. He's so precise in his scripting. Um, I've gotten to about here. Uh, Let's see. We're going to be... Okay, yeah, like Mitchum is the the guy who's selling the property to Joker. We're getting some insights into Mitchum uh, and who he is, what he's about, stuff that is not in the book. Alan Moore is trying to sell Brian Boland on re- revamping Joker's costume a little bit. It's November. Don't give him the same old purple outfit. Isn't it a shame that he only has one pair of clothes? That kind of thing. <laughs> Keeping Brian Boland engaged in the material. Uh, but this is about where I'm at. Uh, I'm still, you know, I'm going to go th- tonight for before bed. I'm going to read for an hour and just keep co- comparing and contrasting the whole thing. But incredibly I love that they like oh my goodness like, what a great piece that is to get both original art and like the the rough the the layouts when you see the layouts it it feels like like there's a sense that I get man when I'm looking at uh the because there's you know there's several in here um 
your typical cartoonist stops here. Like they draw their stuff out of imagination and then they basically stop here though, though they go to ink this Brian is like, okay, now I have to like pose in front of the mirror with this, with a zoot suit on and see how the folds work. Uh, I need to light a certain thing. I like, like it's time for him to start doing reference things and see and figure almost like this is helping him figure out like what kind of reference he must acquire. Uh, I need to underlight my face while I'm drawing yeah. this Joker to make to make sure that the shadows land correctly. I love seeing the perspective uh-huh. too. Even in the rough, you're 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 working out the perspective. Yeah, man. Because that would be one that you could easily do now digital. And this is one of the pieces we were talking about. Yeah, I was and, and to you know try what? Figure out. You know what? That's definitely a screen. Yeah, yeah. You can see it where it's cut out on a couple of these pieces. But I can't you know, tell even what the, the monitor. You can see where it ends. Yeah, but I can't tell what this one is. Yeah, I don't see a screen edge. Like I, I think, uh, as he said, it's drawn. Yeah. Um. So I wanted to get. Man, I love every time an original page pops. Up. Right. Right. Oh man, they're just so stunning. Yeah. You know, right. it's it's um. But one of the things that we were talking about that I wanted to get on on video is this idea of what is going on on these scripts. Yeah. You know, did Alan Moore do a, a rough layout yeah. uh, for himself? Did he do that based on a rough story outline and then a rough layout and then go back in and do these tightened scripts? And the reason that it interests me is because I make comics. So, like, how do I make my comics better? And, Ed, we've talked a lot about our own process of almost writing in drawn form, you know, something that I see a lot of cartoonists like a Chris Ware proponent sure. of. <clears throat> Um, you see it in Harvey Kurtzman layouts, you know, almost going right to the paper for the stories. And it makes me think if Alan Moore is doing, here's the rough outline. Now here's my rough layout. Now here's my detailed script. He's essentially Marvel methoding. Yeah. Uh, which is brilliant because the great innovation to me of the Marvel method is once you see the art, then you put the words on the page to best complement the art. I think some of Frank Miller's collaborations are the, that's awesome. I think some of Frank Miller's collaborations with like a Bill Sienkiewicz on Electra Assassin is one of the highlights of that, of like or, or Hard Boiled, where it's like you get the art back and now you've got to rewrite <laughs> to, to fit that artwork. But as somebody who's writing and drawing it myself, like I have a page right now, the next page I'm drawing, the script is one sentence, but it's six panels. You know, like I did a bunch of drawing in my layout. If I were to go back, because I'm, I think I'm going to try this. Now I'm going to go back in with my layout knowing the pages that come before and after this rough, and I'm going to write a script like this yeah. as a way to better know those panels, yes. to possibly nail you know, better better narration, better text, but also just to know it better. Just some, there, you, you, you add visual things that you might not have if you wouldn't have. Uh, one of the things that I was going to suggest to the kayfabers, which, by the way, the 128-page script and a 48-page comic book, so there it is right there. Um, one of the things I was going to put out to the universe was uh, use this Alan Moore script and draw your draw a Batman killing joke. Get together with your friends, draw it. The thing is, it's so detailed in its presentation that your shit would just look like the printed killing joke book. Unless you went wildly beyond the script, you will be doing all the same things. There's a precision here, and I think that uh, you know if you have a creative capital to Go ahead, put that script together, and still feel the energy toward drawing the thing that you just like laid out. That could be tremendously beneficial because you will have a lot more color. You'll you'll know the characters uh, what what the characters thinking, their mood, what they're feeling. You'll know what the weather is. You know if if a, if a bad smell came across their their nose, and if so, where did it come from? That kind of stuff. You'll add a lot of life to it, but the artist has to has to make the the sort of honest sort of, uh, what would you call it, man? You would have to be honest with yourself and know whether you'll fizzle out or if that's an additional piece. Yeah, I don't that know that it's... part um, of your process. Right, and, and I, don't know, I don't know about a standard process. You know, no. I don't know that there's one no method. Thing. But, but I do feel like it's, it's another one of those tools. Like, we took a writing class years ago while we were doing Cartoonist Kayfabe. So if you look back through our archives, you can see us talk a little bit about it. But one of the impressive things to me in that class is how when we would meet, our teacher would have read everybody's stuff from that week. And as we're working through problems, it was always in the text. Yeah. Like she would find these answers. It's not what she was. She wasn't writing a new, uh, uh, you know, a new subplot for us, but she would pull stuff out of the, what we had written is like, you know, there's you talk about this character here. It's in there. And that always stuck with me from that class. 
So I do think there's value and I feel like it's another approach to this tool of comics making that um, maybe you don't use it all the time, but it's ideal for the next page that's literally coming up on my drawing table this week. So, so uh, boy, I'm looking forward to it. And holy cow, man, right. this is a guy that can draw. It is, wow. man. But like, you know, this is his roughs and stuff. And like I said, if it was anybody else, you would you go from this, maybe pencil a little tighter and then, and then ink from that. But like, he's going to make sure that the folds are correct and he's going to make sure that the gun is all right. You know, he's not drawing purely from imagination. He's, he's setting things up for himself. This is super fascinating because like there are three or four lines here where he's drawing slight variations on the cape sketching. Yeah. They all look really good. Totally. But the idea that someone as precise as him, I guess maybe you have to work through this if you're really going to be that that exact composition guy, you know? So like, dude, this is a typewriter when you're, when you're setting up your pages and getting approvals from like Mark Chiarello or whoever would have uh, signed off on this Batman black and white strip. Pretty cool. Uh, worth having. Um, King Kayfabers who are watching in the Patre Patreon uh, live stream right now, they got first dibs on the cheapest copies that are out there. Like after we, we are the first Kayfabers, you know? Uh, so like after the conversation with Brian, I went on uh, Amazon and bought a $20 copy. Uh, it's a $50 book. It's not going to really break the bank if you get it at cover price. But there are cheap copies out there if you're early in, on in the game. And I, I do think that this is a very valuable uh, way to have this book. And I, I do think that you do not get rid of your original either. To, to take the comics course, man, with Alan Moore. Read the script and look at the fucking artwork right, right, right next to it. Boy, that's clever. Throwing the logo up in the air like a ball. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and look at the rough for that. Yeah. You know, the rough is sharp. It really is, man. He captures that stuff in the rough. Like, the, the gestures you want, the, po the body language, the expressions, that's all in that rough. Yeah. You know, like, Derek Robertson's a guy who, who vocally says that, you know, uh, that ball is an influence. And, like, this is, like, the Derek Robertson level of, like, the Brian Ball and Cribbing. Like, with this kind of ink and stuff. So, like, this is what mortals can do. It makes but then sense this, to But me. then this is, this is, like, how Brian Ball and, like, takes it to the next. This is the part that, d that defies logic to me. Mm -hmm. You know, like, to be able to go from this, full of life, and which to is, this and still keep the life in it. And this, and this is satisfying. That's magic. Yeah, like, you could... Anybody would be satisfied to draw that and, and put that out there and be satisfied to take your pay, your page rate or whatever your cover rate but no he's going to do this and and you just know that when he's getting in there and he has this thing zoomed in four thousand percent that he's making sure that not one pixel is out of alignment you know it yeah he's that guy hmm. amazing you know something else i was paying attention to taking a look at this uh from our conversation noise no noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Noise, no noise. I do a lot of noise in that Hulk, in Hulk Grand Design. Like when he was describing it, it, it made me think of that because it does, in a way, give it a little more texture, a little more yeah. tactile feeling. Do you use the noise button or use textures that you scan in? I will add noise organically. I, I do everything, but, yeah. but I'll add noise organically and then I'll soft blur like half of a, of a percent or one percent. Depending yeah. on what it is, like sometimes I'll blur different. Sometimes I don't use it either. You know, like whenever we talk about using like the full saturation colors in X Men Grand Design, Hulk Grand Design, sometimes there's no noise, so you do get that like ultra flat, hundred percent right. yellow or something. Um, it's it's just effects that you have access to. You know, like use all of them. Use whatever one works for you. Um, I have to admire the green <laughs> bookmarker as we look at oh, that's funny. The, the little details on our Joker on our cover art. Now it looks like this is the guy at the front of your gondola. <laughs> gondola, however you say that Boy, word. Well, that's a nightmare ride. <laughs> <laughs> Not the guy you want to turn around. <laughs> Laughing in the dark, man. You good to go, Jimmy? Yes, I am. Gay Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. I said it before, said it again, man. The people who are on our Patreon are getting our first dibs on these uh, comics that we talk about on the aftermarket. And the people who support us the, the most are uh, watching us live stream these conversations. They're getting all the cheapest copies of everything. What I'm saying is the Patreon pays for itself. Uh, the videos are brought to you by the books that we make. You're looking at a bunch of them. Tell them what you got out there, Jimmy. Hulk Grand Design and Street Angel Princess of Poverty are in the pre-order reserve your copy state. So I recommend you do that as soon as possible because those Hulk Grand Design books have been selling. So uh, let your story know you want those. 
Also, Plain Janes and Street Angel Deadly Girl Alive are both in print and available. Add those to your shelf collection now. You can also join me on patreon.com slash jimrug where you can download out-of-print zines and mini-comics. You can see a lot more of my original art and process. You can see what I'm working on next there. Red Room Crypto Killers issue number one is being solicited to your comic shops at this very moment, and we need to know how many of them to print up, man. So go to your local comic shop, put in those pre-orders. There's going to be four monthly issues. There are two trade paperbacks out there right now. Red Room Trigger Warnings and Red Room The Antisocial Network. I'm serializing all the comics before they hit paper. Go to my Patreon uh, in the link tree in the description below. You'll be able to get their uh, 10-year anniversary Hip Hop Family Tree. Scoop up those books. Three volumes of X-Men Grand Design out there. You might find a WYSIWYG if you're lucky. Jimmy, tell the people what else we got going on. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, mugs, hats, stickers, and more merch at our spread shop. That link is also below this video. Great way to support the channel. Given those marching orders, Jimmy, we'll be on our way. Make more comics.